Mr. Brian Kamoy has a deep background in global health and crisis management. He has served as Deputy Secretary for Preparedness and Response and Senior Director for Preparedness Policy on the White House National Security Council. He currently serves as the Department of Homeland Security Distinguished Chair of Leadership at the Stockdale Center at the United States Naval Academy. Dr. Julie Louise Gerberding served as the first female director of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she led the agency through the American response to SARS. She served as the director of Merck's Vaccine Division and was appointed her executive vice president and chief patent officer. She also co-chairs the Commission on Strengthening America's Health Security. Ms. Lori Garrett is a Pulitzer Prize and George Polk Award-winning science journalist and author. She has written numerous best-selling books, including The Coming Plague, Betrayal of Trust, and I Heard the Siren Scream. As a Harvard Fellow, she worked with the Emerging Diseases Group. She also has served as a Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations. Moderating today's panel is Second Class Caroline Finley, a political science major who serves as the Deputy Director of Academic Content for the conference. Hello, NAFAC delegates, moderators, distinguished guests, and welcome to the third day of NAFAC 2021, where we focus on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I have the pleasure of moderating this discussion panel composed of a number of distinguished professionals at the top of their fields on the work that they've done on our subject. With me, I have Dr. Julie Louise Gerberding, the Executive Vice President of Merck, Ms. Lori Garrett, a Pulitzer Prize winning author and member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mr. Brian Kamoy, who currently serves as the Department of Homeland Security Distinguished Chair of Leadership at the Stockdale Center right here at the United States Naval Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the U.S. Naval Academy and the Foreign Affairs Conference, thank you all so much for being here today. And if I may begin, um, our lessons learned portion of the conference focuses on three key aspects of the pandemic response. And those are what we as a global community missed in preparing for the pandemic, COVID-19's immediate effects, and the future of a world order post-COVID. And so we'll go ahead and pivot to that first question um, for, our, for our discussion today. So first question, to you all. Um, in the early 21st century, there were a number of forecasts of the challenges that a pathogen turned pandemic would pose to the world. Some of these were SARS, H1N1, and Ebola virus, just to name a few. And so this is a question open to the group. As, as COVID-19 shocks the world domestically and internationally, what did we miss in preparing for this pandemic and how can we prepare for the next one? I'll start <laughs> and give the rest of you a chance to jump all over whatever I say. Um, I think overall, we went into the 21st century with a 20th century mentality that saw disease as somebody else's problem. That outbreaks, particularly this sort of Ebola-like outbreak, would be something that happened in a poor country somewhere else and America would benevolently come to rescue. We would apply our technologies, skills, and pharmaceuticals to bring assistance to those in need. What we didn't imagine and we didn't adequately consider outside the context of bioterrorism preparedness, which is another whole topic, but very much underpinning a lot of what may have been holes in our pre preparations today, is we really thought of it as somebody else. It, it wouldn't be something that would overwhelm America. When we had scenarios that imagined America overwhelmed, it was always influenza or bioterrorism. And I think after 2001 and the anthrax letters, there came to be a big shift in, in a lot of the thinking and conversation about emerging diseases so that issues related to deliberate release came to have uh, higher importance. And I'm sure Dr. Gerberdin can go into detail on that because she played such a crucial role uh, in the post 9-11 CDC world. But um, what, it, what it meant is that we, we weren't thinking the way we should have been. Uh, how do our local health departments stand? Do they have working computers? Are they adequately sourced with material for their labs and so on? a tremendous amount of vulnerability had been identified in the context of bioterrorism, seeing that a lot of our laboratories in local health departments couldn't actually diagnose anthrax, couldn't diagnose the key agents that were of concern after 9-11. And so a lot went into preparing them and bringing them up to speed. But ironically, after 
2009 with the H1N1 influenza, which should have been a, the number one shot across the bow warning to everyone. Um, we, we remained uh, in a kind of odd position where we saw our own health departments get overwhelmed by flu and have difficulty rolling out vaccine. We saw all the frailties and yet we failed to really respond. And on the global level, we lost a lot of credibility because America made vaccine for Americans. The Swiss made products for the Swiss and so on. And most of the world didn't get anywhere near a vaccine until that entire H1N1 swine flu epidemic was been and gone. You know, the day was passed. So here we are today, and most of the lessons we should have learned, particularly from 2009, went unrepaired, and we find ourselves vulnerable as a result. I, th I think I can just build on what Lori said, because I completely agree with her. Um, we, I've gone uh, through all of the after action reports that I could get my hands on after each one of these events. And they all pretty much say the same thing. But uh, the common theme that I, that I certainly have been reflecting on over the past several weeks really falls into sort of three related buckets. The first is scale. Um, you know, we, we, we did not have the imagination to really fully comprehend what a pandemic would look like, especially one that spread this fast and, and so broadly out of the starting gate. I think the second area of maybe failure of imagination was the simultaneity that we were going to need to support the community of healthcare provision and the community of vaccine delivery and the community of countermeasures across the board simultaneously in virtually every location, not just in the United States, but essentially around the world. And then the third um, dimension, again, related is that of sustainability, meaning it's one thing if you have something that comes and goes. It's another thing when it goes on and on and on. So let me just give three quick examples of how I think those things interact. Um, obviously, in the US, a major one is testing. Um, we really didn't appreciate how important it was to be able to scale testing to cover 300 million Americans over and over and over again for a very long period of time. Uh, part of that was, as Lori pointed out, our scenario planning was usually based on influenza and influenza testing isn't really very important. So we didn't think about what would it need to look like if we had to test everyone often for, uh, for the same virus. Uh, a second example um, clearly relates to the, the challenge of the, the, uh, the vaccine allocation and uptake. That it's one thing to have um, wonderful products coming out faster than we ever imagined possible, but it's another thing to appreciate that there's no there there in most of the world in terms of delivering vaccines, particularly to adults. And maybe I'll just add, you know, a, an additional dimension, and that really, re really relates to the challenge of the the doctrine. Um, our doctrine has sort of been detect, contain, mitigate detect as it emerges, try to contain it if you can and mitigate it. But never did we think about prediction or preemption. And I think those are really big misses that as we apply ourselves going forward, we need to spend a lot more time understanding why emergence and spillover occurs or from a national security perspective, where are the hot spots where uh, we can anticipate the greatest threat from intentional bioterrorism events. So a lot of work and a lot of lessons learned. Yeah, and if I would, you know, underscore so many of the points that both Dr. Gerberding and Ms. Garrett uh, have made, uh, I mean, it's really about building and sustaining uh, the public health infrastructure. Uh, did we know uh, a pandemic uh, was uh, likely? Uh, of course, and we've done extensive planning, um, but we got lucky with H1N1 in 2009, 2010. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we lost a lot of lives and a lot of people got sick, um, but was not as virulent. It did not turn out to be uh, obviously as bad as COVID. Uh, and we tend to have this, you know, very reactionary posture where 
frankly, it is, uh, you know, it's more exciting to fund the lights and sirens response capability. Uh, and then after the immediate crisis passes, uh, attention moves elsewhere. Uh, so the long term investments in buildings and sustaining capability um, aren't uh, as of interest uh, as they need to be. Um, so my hope is that COVID-19 is, you know, yet another wake up call um, that we need to do better uh, and really learn the lessons. Uh, and, and I agree with Dr. Gerberding. If you pull the after action reports uh, on any number uh, of these uh, events, um, they typically say the same kinds of things. Uh, we need better real-time clinical surveillance. We need uh, a more responsive stockpile with diagnostics. Dr. Gerberding just mentioned about the testing. Uh, those are some of the uh, points from H1N1 in 2009 and 10 uh, that, as Ms. Garrett mentioned, should have been the wake-up call that it wasn't. Um, so no need to belabor that, but we, we really do need to take the time now and reflect uh, on what the lessons are and how we can prepare for the next one, uh, because there will be a next pandemic. I'd just like to add one thing that probably um, doesn't come up from a public health perspective, but should have. Um, and I think back of all the exercising, you know, crawl, walk, run, full scale functional exercises, we really worked hard to go deep on pandemic preparedness, but we were functioning as this was as if this was just a health problem. And we weren't really thinking about how do we simultaneously prepare for the economic consequences, which we did know about. We saw that with SARS and certainly there was an economic consequence of Ebola and H1N1 as well. But our planning scenarios, even when we were uh, planning as a government with a whole of government set of directives, um, we didn't really think about what would Congress need to do or how were we going to provide economic security so that people could cooperate with the interventions that we knew would be required to slow down and contain spread. So that was a big miss. And I hope that we will go forward and make sure that we're thinking whole of government response, whole of citizen centric response and not just as a health problem. Well, that, that calls to mind. You remember the debates we had at the opening of H1N1. They almost seem quaint now about school closures. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one of the things that came up uh, in those kind of interagency discussions from the, the from the White House was the economic consequences of parents, single parents who did not have paid leave uh, and what would happen to them. And I remember distinctly, um, you know, discussions of, well, uh, you know, that's not the CDC's concern. That's not a public health problem, but then not really addressing it. And again, the virus turned out to be such that we didn't recommend school closure, um, but obviously COVID presented a very different scenario, uh, but I couldn't agree more. I mean, kind of a, a holistic approach to the second and third order effects that we now understand, um, you know, sustained school closure, sustained business closure. We used to, I mean, all of our planning assumptions, you may remember this, Dr. Gerberding, but was 60% we, uh, or 40% we assumed uh, critical infrastructure workforce would just be out of work. Um, nobody ever really planned for what accommodation would be need to be made for the people who continued to work. Uh, all of the technology needs of work from home um, and all of the kind of the, the health and sanitation needs for a workforce that continues to go to work. So I, I couldn't agree more. We, we focused on some things to the exclusion of others uh, and there are social and economic consequences we just didn't get right. In fact, as recently as September, 2019, uh, former treasury secretary, Larry Summers and former British exchequer and prime minister, Gordon Brown co-authored an analysis with Dean Jameson from the World Bank in which they forecast a worst case scenario of a pandemic costing, <gasps> shame, horrible $600 billion. <laughs> and then Larry came out in uh, May with a revision calling the current epidemic the $16 trillion <laughs> virus. Uh, and I think you know, while everybody has heard the stories over the centuries of the tension between commerce, business on one side, trade and so on, and public health on the other side. And, you know, I, I hope that all of the people attending this 
conference at some point read Heinrich Ibsen's Enemy of the People to know what the real drama is when you pit public health against business interests. I don't think anyone adequately imagined and even now fully is calibrating for the tension between massive financial interests and losses versus public health interests. And we have seen this play out in every locality across America and across the world. And it's sometimes as simple as a mother who uh, can't tolerate another minute of trying to work from home with two under five-year-olds at her feet and no money to help, to hire help and no additional place to put them except right at her feet while she tries to virtually work. From that all the way up to a Fortune 500 CEO trying to figure out how to maintain some segment of his workforce and plan for the quote, post COVID time. What workforce will he need? Where will they work from? Will they ever again be inside buildings and offices? If so, who needs to be in such an office? And all of this is being reshaped by the time we get to the other end of this epidemic, it'll be a, a completely different world. Garrett, absolutely. And I appreciate all of your very nuanced responses to that question. And I'd like to pivot back to something Dr. Gerberding said um, specifically about planning for future pandemics. And one of the earliest breakdowns in this pandemic's response occurred between the World Health Organization and the United States for a variety of reasons. And so as we let, let's pivot to an international type of analysis, as the U.S. rejoins the World Health Organization underneath the Biden administration, what are some measures that both nations and multinational organizations can take in order to help ensure a future unified pandemic response? So I, I will start this. And I'm really interested in what my co-panelists have to say on the topic because I have a feeling we see this um, sort of elephant um, from a lot of different perspectives. But um, I think there's a bigger issue than the US WHO relationship here. It's the WHO itself um, and the, the modernization of our global health consortium, if you will, is something that is long overdue, um, but it's very, very difficult from a global political perspective to make that happen. And our most powerful lever really is the membership of the wealthier countries that contribute the most resource to allow the WHO to function. Brian probably remembers uh, during the um, era when we were post SARS, um, it was the US government really who went in and built the operations center at, at the WHO. I mean, we, we presented it as a collaborative process, but really we just modeled what we had in the Humphrey building and made sure that the capacities were there at the World Health Organization. And I'm not saying that to sound arrogant. I'm saying it because, you know, you have to have a there there in order to have um, a, a, a sophisticated biosecurity um, function at the World Health Organization. The organization has an extremely broad agenda. Um, it is influenced from all sorts of directions. Um, a lot of people don't appreciate that the director general doesn't have as much authority over the regional um, health organizations as might uh, appear on paper or in the news and particularly the financial control over those entities. So there's a great deal of um, discombobulation in terms of how alignment is achieved and how decisions flow. It's a one nation, one vote entity. So that allows for large blocks of like-minded countries to have a very powerful position in terms of the shaping of policy. And I could go on from there. So I think there's um, a sufficient um, interest across the broader range of sectors and leaders on a global basis right now to really understand as was called for after the Ebola outbreaks, I might add, in West Africa that we really need to modernize and in a sense reinvent the World Health Organization so that it can function in the areas where we most need that international uh, authority and collaboration. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it can be all things to all people. And so narrowing the aperture of responsibility and making sure that the essential things are done well 
and the technical support is sanctioned and scientific in its origin is key. So shorter answer to the question about what does that mean for the US now in terms of our engagement, obviously we can take our cards and go home. It is the only platform we have right now that functions in any approximation of what would be helpful. And so our challenge is how can we be part of the solution and how can we engage thoughtful people in addition to our own government to really come up with a solution that isn't nationalistic in our own interest only, but actually represents the greater global good. Probably sounds a little Pollyannish, but um, we have to make sure that we've exhausted every opportunity to allow the WHO to fulfill a much more important and effective role than I think it has in the recent past. Well, I, 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 I think I would disagree with a couple of your points, but overall, um, follow your trend. Um, as long as I've been going to WHO and I was trying to think, I, I think the first time I ever set foot in the building in Geneva was 1980. Um, as long as I've been going, I've been hearing, oh, WHO needs to be reformed. Oh, we're undergoing a reform process. Oh, there's another reform review underway. And every single time the complaints boil down to the same basic problem, which is its charter from 1948 which is essentially the constitution that it operates by, and the fact that it has a governing body, which is Julie referred to as one country, one vote of all the nations of the planet. So that, you know, the Seychelles has an equal vote to India or Costa Rica has an equal vote to Russia. Um, and it's a, it, it's, a, it's a cumbersome mess. However, today, when we talk about global health and, and governance of global health, there's a lot more involved than WHO because the main thing that's happened with each reform initiative, once it really peaked, is that a new entity was created and a problem was identified. Oh, WHO isn't dealing with the AIDS epidemic. Create the United Nations AIDS organization. Oh, WHO isn't dealing with distribution of supplies and goods in a decent way. Okay, create the global fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. Oh, WHO is not dealing with vaccines create Gavi, the list goes on and on and on and large and small. And what it effectively has done is create a very fragmented architecture of global health with a lot of jockeying for authority between agencies and for money and, and, and exacerbated a pre-existing problem of countries, donor countries, um, using their money to leverage certain policies because now you know, they can leverage one agency against another agency. It's, it's bigger and, and more robust. Um, in the case of the current epidemic, it's really curious because I was part of one of the big reviews of WHO's performance um, in the Ebola epidemic. Uh, and I was in the epidemic in two, two of the countries. Um, and there were some very strong and angry uh, feelings around the entire world about how WHO had performed. It didn't have a leg to stand on. And everybody knew it, including the leadership inside WHO. And there were a lot of recommendations about creating a robust pandemic and epidemic response capacity, training every nation to be its own uh, surveillance system, to be its own capacity for resilience and response. Um, putting our Centers for Disease Control at the center of that training exercise internationally. Um, but when the next big election for a new director general came around, the theme that trumped everything was universal health coverage. And so Tedros from Ethiopia was elected the director general, um, pretty much putting the whole question of outbreaks off to the side somewhere. And the central issue was creating uh, primary healthcare systems uh, all over the world. And the argument was, if you have robust primary care, you won't have difficulty responding to epidemics. So here we are in a pandemic that has slammed the most robust universal healthcare systems on earth, China, Japan, all of, what, of Europe, Canada. I mean, you know, what examples do we need to point to the fact that the two entities, this constant struggle between 
chronic care, primary health systems focus versus pandemic and epidemic responses, that that tension remains permanently unresolved. And that, you know, one is about organized medicine and one is about public health. And that goes right to the roots of what we're dealing with right here domestically. You look around the country. I, I live in New York City. We have what many people two years ago would have said is the best public health department of any city in the world. It is certainly the most pioneering public health department in any municipality on planet earth bar none. And yet it's performed poorly because the, the mayor decided that organized medicine was more important than public health, uh, cut the knees off of the entire public health department and put the hospital corporation in charge of everything. The result, once again, organized medicine triumphs and smashes the always underfunded, always undervalued, always underpowered public health. Well, I will leave the kind of the particulars uh, and reform of the WHO to Ms. Garrett and Dr. Gerberding, who know much more about it than I do. Uh, but from my experience uh, in H1N1 and others, um, what I'd say is we need a, I mean, we need a commitment uh, to coordinated kind of planning together. And, you know, I agree with Dr. Gerberding, maybe something like that sounds Pollyannish, but uh, I think you mentioned it. Uh, uh, Caroline, you know, kind of nationalism uh, has reared its head uh, during this pandemic, has reared its head globally, you know, politically. Um, so be it a reform WHO or other kinds of organizations, uh, I think we need to have a very honest assessment of what happened here uh, and how uh, we can demonstrate to everyone, um, you know, the value of coordinated work to prevent uh, you know, further disease burden, further pandemics. Uh, what structure that takes, uh, I think, you know, there'll be a lot of robust discussion and debate on that. Uh, I do think we need to recommit, though, to uh, kind of coordinated planning uh, in whatever kind of venue that uh, can be accomplished most effectively. Absolutely, absolutely. And kind of to continue along that line of international cooperation, excuse me, cooperation and um, globalization, uh, Mr. Kamoy actually suggested that I direct this question particularly to Dr. Gerberding and Ms. Garrett. Um, and I would, again, do that, but open this to the entire floor. What are some effects of this pandemic that we can expect to see on trends like globalization over the next year, over the next five years, over the next decades? Well, I'm waiting for Glo for Laurie to jump in here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think a message. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. You're going to, I apologize. No worries. No worries, Ms. Garrett. So basically, just the question was, what can we expect to see? How can we expect to see this pandemic affect globalization in the future? Uh, well, just today, I was in two historic meetings already. Um, the first was uh, a call from 25 nations to uh, begin a treaty process to create the first true international pandemic treaty. Uh, what that might look like, I don't know, but I do know that, you know, the tobacco convention was signed in 2005 and the United States Congress has yet to sign it. And uh, it took 21 years to get to the Paris Agreement on Climate. And we know how the Trump administration responded to that. So um, I'm not really sure where a treaty is going to go, but it illustrates concern that the current, current global structure, and in particular, the international health regulations, which are meant to be the way that WHO has governance in epidemics and outbreaks, that that process is, is failing us. It's inadequate. Um, the second meeting today was very much in response to the uh, accusations and counter accusations that have fired with ever heightened vitriol between the United States and China over the origins of this virus. Uh, with the United States under the Trump administration insisting that it was made in or leaked from the Wuhan um, Virology Institute uh, and was a uh, therefore either a biosafety break or a deliberate release of some kind. 
Um, and the Chinese insisting that that was not true and that it may have even come from outside China. Um, so today, uh, the independent team that was put together 34 individuals to investigate um, evidence available in at this time in China um, released its final report, or actually not final because they insist that a key point of the report is this process is going to have to go on possibly for years. Um, and uh, you know they end up saying that both sides are, are schmucks. Uh, neither side is right in this charge counter charge that there's very good reason to believe based on the, and I, I actually have jotted it down to keep track, the 76,253 respiratory health records they studied in Wuhan the 80,000 wildlife samples they scrutinized, the 923 animal market samples analyzed, the supply chains for wildlife smuggling through 20 countries they scrutinized. Based on all of that, they are uh, quite convinced this was a spillover event from a wild animal um, likely related to the illegal smuggling trade for human consumption of wild animals from throughout Southeast Asia and Southern China. Um, then it would mirror what of course happened in 2003 with SARS. But you know, the big picture is if we can't get past this, um, you know, Jacques Hughes approach to epidemics, this sort of denunciation and recrimi recriminations of approach, then we're never going to have globalization on the stage. You know, the most positive thing that's happened so far was the creating of COVAX, which is uh, the uh, multilateral um, attempt to come up with a fair and just distribution of vaccines to all countries, rich and poor alike, organized jointly by UNICEF, WHO, Gavi, Global Fund, World Bank, huge list, you know, of organizations. Um, and in spirit, it's precisely where every single one of these epidemics should be. And it should include PPE. It should include diagnostics and testing and surveillance equipment. It should include medications uh, that may prove effective. But in reality, you know, it's underfunded by about 90%. Uh, it uh, lacks real commitments of vaccines because indeed the rich countries are hoarding vaccine supplies uh, to such a degree that it's, it's inconceivable right now that uh, any African nation is going to get any serious amount of vaccine. And we see now Cuba is rising up to become a major vaccine producer for Latin America. Ch uh, China has five vaccines. It's distributing along the Belt and Road and it's become an instrument of their general uh, diplomacy uh, stretching uh, Chinese economic interests across not just Asia, but well into the Middle East and Northern Africa. And uh, of course, the Russians claim that their uh, Sputnik vaccine is a wonder, and they're using it as a leverage and tool, even though the people of Russia are refusing to, to take it. Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the citizenry have a voice in this. Um, I'm, I'm just listening to my own peer group in the uh, pharma sector, but I think really across all of the sectors that I network with, there's this pent up desire to bring the world back together. So we're going to have the tension of the need to take nationalistic decisions, or at least the, in, you know, the, um, the likelihood that there's a political demand for that. And at the same time, we have a citizenry who in many ways is very global. We're global in our own personal supply chains. We're global in our travel plans. We're global in the things we're interested in, what we listen to, where we go. So it, it, it's going to be an interesting resettling of those sort of opposite vectors when we come through this. And I suspect you know, we won't settle for some time and we'll probably gradually evolve um, into a new normal, as everyone keeps talking about. But um, I, I happen to believe, just based on my own professional perspectives, as well as my industry, that um, we will always be global. 
that there is no way to have a US only supply chain for, uh, you know, to really function in a, a manner that's independent of others. But I think what the pandemic has taught us is that we need to be able to survive when we are in a more lockdown slash nationalistic environment. And that it's part of our national security doctrine that we need to make sure that our nation can defend itself and provide for its citizens in such times as pandemics or other sorts of security threats make it um, essential that we have more um, survival ability. And I think we've discovered that we are incredibly vulnerable right now to not really having adequately thought through what what exactly is in that essentialist. And I'm not talking just about the strategic national stockpile, I'm talking about a much broader set of considerations. Uh, if, if I might add, uh, I mean, I would uh, agree with what Dr. Garrett and Dr. Gerberding and I owe Dr. Garrett an apology uh, because uh, uh, I neglected uh, in the materials to uh, review uh, uh, that uh, her appropriate title is doctor as well. So uh, my apologies. Um, one of the things though on this notion of citizenry, and I know that a prior panel uh, on comparative response talked about kind of this, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes versus democracies, uh, and in the materials was reference to Freedom House, which uh, I'm not familiar with all of the work of the Freedom House organization, but I saw that, uh, you know, their whole uh, purpose is that, you know, freedom flourishes in democratic nations where governments are accountable to their people. Um, in bringing the world kind of back together, uh, one of the things I think we need to address are uh, some of the things that Freedom House pointed out in America's democracy that has undermined the health of our democracy, unequal treatment for people of color, improper influence of money in politics, partisan polarization and extremism. I think at least two of those three uh, are at play uh, during this pandemic here. Uh, unequal treatment of people of color. We've seen the pandemic have a disproportionate impact uh, on uh, um, historically underrepresented communities in America and partisan polarization and extremism. Uh, never did I imagine that standard public health guidance such as wear a mask would become as partisan of an issue uh, as it has become. Um, so while I agree uh, there are uh, you know a lot of global effects on this, uh, I think we have some things to focus on here uh, in, as we kind of try and bring the world back together as well. If I may, I'll just add one thing kind of because Julie brought it to my mind and, and, and I thank her for it. You're, you're right that um, there will always be globalization. My goodness, you know, we're not gonna go back to the world where all toasters used to toast toast in America are made in America, you know, or every component of that toaster is made in America. But I think that it's interesting, surveys of Fortune 500 CEOs um, and, uh, you know, multiple economic analyses show that one of the big take home lessons corporate leaders are getting out of all of this is, oops, just in time delivery doesn't work when the supply chain falls apart. Whether it's a tanker facing the wrong way in the Suez Canal, or you know, it's a global pandemic that causes uh, the entire supply chain to shatter. Um, it, it, we're going to see a lot more inventory, a lot more storing elements of your production chain in proximity to your central, you know, site of uh, distribution, we're 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 going to, I think, curiously see both a greater dependence on Amazon and companies that try to mimic the Amazon model, while at the same time, uh, companies that are uh, have a major manufacturing bent are going to want to see ways to onshore more of their manufacturing. So. For example, uh, you know, the idea that we'll ever be in a situation as we found out we were in H1N1, where the majority of all medical masks are made in two countries and neither of them is the United States of America. Um, bad news story, right? And now where we are, I think at this point is as we expand mRNA vaccine production to 
hopefully reach billions of doses. And testing based on nucleic acids. What we're finding as the big supply chain mess is, is the making of nucleosides and enzymes mm -hmm. for manufacture and cleanup of nucleic acids. And so actually that is now the roadblock that's holding everything up. And at, the, at this point, the companies are all saying, you know, we'll take it from anywhere. We'll take it from the whole entire world, any place that wants to start making this stuff. Please, we need it, we're desperate. So I think we're gonna see elements of, of globalization swing all the way back to where they were, while other elements will be permanently in a new place. And the permanently in new place, I think, is going to especially affect physical manufacturing, whether it's automobiles or clothing or Nike shoes. There's going to be a greater sense of the vulnerability of both the just-in-time model and the highly dispersed global manufacturing model. Well, and I don't mean to steal the moderator's prerogative, Dr. Garrett, but now I'm curious. So what effect do you think the Amazons of the world will have on this? And we're still vulnerable to, frankly, kind of run-of-the-mill shipping emergencies like container ships getting stuck in the Suez Canal. So does that have an effect on the discussions around how to you know, reform the WHO or what kind of the global health governance looks like in 10 or 20 years with the rise of Amazon and others? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> because it, here's, here's my thinking. And, you know, Julie, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be dying to know your reaction to this because I haven't really put this out here, out there this much. But my feeling is if this crisis coupled with the undeniable crisis point we're at with climate change isn't enough to force a deep rethink, uh, then you know we can just pack it up and folks Caroline's age are gonna have to live in a hell of a nasty world that we're gonna you know, bequeath to them. Because we've been operating on underfunded programs with non-sustained funding, funding that would jump you know, at a time of crisis and then go down. And everybody would say, oh, we should be ready next time. We have a whole bunch of let's get ready meetings after action reports and then everybody goes to sleep and the funding disappears and the personnel that were trained no longer are being paid so they go off to other work and the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats and we should have by now seen enough deleterious impact from COVID on the corporate sector on the large financial sector, on the currency exchange sectors, that all of them might be amenable to finally reviewing the whole question of the sort of Robin Hood monetary tax for a multi-million plus currency exchange or other models that would essentially tax um, globalized corporate scale finance and wealth to, on a permanent basis, subsidize public health, subsidize pandemic preparedness, subsidize uh, surveillance in resource scarce countries, and subsidize uh, you know, climate adaptation and mitigation efforts. Unless we get money away from just dependency on government, we're never going to be better prepared because government never has enough of it. And most of the governments of the world are in the hold out your hands for money mode, not the drop the money in the box mode. And um, the scale of the need is now in, you know, into the trillions, which is far beyond what our Congress is prepared to sign off on, much, much less anybody else's parliament. I, I agree with Lori in, in one sense, but I, you know, I think there's also again, a doctrine issue. And our doctrine is that preparedness for bio threats is a public health issue. I think it's a national security issue and we need to adopt a mindset and a doctrine that looks more like our military security doctrine. And that means that we, um, we progressively improve and update our level of preparedness. We invest heavily in things that we hope we never have to use. 
we build capacity, skills, and experiences that, again, we hope we never have to use, but from time to time, they need to be deployed, hopefully not at scale. And we recognize that that's a critical function of government. I also understand your point about broader sectoral involvement, and I think um, uh, conversations with the World Bank and others are starting to come around to the point of view that we need to broaden out that pyramid so that there's more at the bottom. And, and again, governments can't do it alone. But that doctrine is to me, the reason that we go through this crisis uh, to complacency cycle over and over again. And then in the US at least, there are structural aspects of it because of the way the discretionary budget allocation and budget balancing has to be done on an annual basis and our public health system is funded annually instead of funded more like the Department of Defense where you invest what is necessary to achieve a certain level of preparedness and response capability. And so there are a number of efforts underway right now. I co-chair uh, with former Senator Ayad, a commission at CSIS to really look at some of these structural issues, the financial aspects of it, as well as the doctrinal dimensions of uh, where do we go from here? But you know, the middle of a pandemic isn't necessarily the best time to be implementing broad-based structural and budgetary reform. We just have to get the job we're doing done. But my fear is that once the job is done, then we'll just go back to the complacency mode again. The other point, Laurie, about the intersection of climate change, um, emergence of bio threats, and the overall in, in growing health disequilibrium in the world, meaning just expanding health inequities. I think if we don't tip now into a different way of business and a different way of preparing and operating, we never will. And that is frightening to me. So I'm giving every spare minute of my time that I can muster to really be an advocate and an ambassador for helping people really understand what's at stake here. We are living in a perfect storm of emergence. We have climate change posing new risks. We have urbanization pushing people further, further into areas of the world where they have more and more connectivity with the animals that used to live there. We have more than 64 million forcibly displaced people in the world that are living in environments that are not hygienic and prone to respiratory disease transmission as well as food and water insecurity and on and on and on. We will face food insecurity and we are already facing water insecurity. So we're, we're suffering already the consequences of our changing climate, which only reinforces the potential for emergence and spread of diseases. And then on top of that, you know, at least up until recently, our incredible global connectivity. So what else will it take? We, 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 we are being hit from every direction. And if, if, the, if, if we can't wake people up, to the reality that we're facing, then I fear that we will never have a chance short of something that is truly, absolutely, globally catastrophic. Amen to all of that. And the only thing I would add is, you know, the, there, the majority of the spillover events where we've seen previously unknown viruses emerge in human beings have come from bats, either directly from the bat or through an intermediary species. And so we have to ask ourselves, why? What's going on with bats? What's the big deal with bats? They are the most um, species diverse of any family of mammals. Um, there are so many different species of bats that I don't even think a bat specialist could rattle off a broad list. And, but the lion's share of them live in the top canopies of rainforests where they are the great pollinators of our forests as they jump from fruit to fruit, nibbling on, on the trees and so on. And those rainforests are getting destroyed. They're getting destroyed by a combination of direct human encroachment. Look at the Amazon. The Amazon actually this week flipped from being a net carbon sink to a net CO2 emitter because of the damage under the Bolsonaro government that is being exercised against the Amazon. It's phenomenal. It's like you took your lungs and instead of exhaling CO2, you just started exhaling oxygen. Um, but the, uh, the 
actual ecologies of bats are threatened by climate change and by destruction of rainforests. And so you have these threatened stressed species of very shy, mostly nocturnal animals coming closer to human habitation out of desperation. You see flocks actually flying into downtown Sydney, Australia, um, uh, coming out of firestorms behind them as the climate claims ever more of the outback. And um, I, I think we, we need to see that these issues overlap tremendously. And if the issues overlap, so should the funding and the governance in ways that will prove effective. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. If I, if I just might, I want to extend Dr. Garrett's metaphor, hands out of the government. If we don't start, you know, hands across working together, um, not only these issues overlap, but one of the false narratives, uh, Dr. Gerben, you mentioned the choice between biodefense and kind of emerging infectious disease, uh, that a narrative that emerged during this pandemic is that it's either or. Uh, and that officials have taken criticism for uh, how the allocation of funding between biodefense and uh, standard public health. Uh, we need to move past that. I mean, there's not enough money in the system, um, but we need to work on all of it. We need to have core public health capabilities from diagnostics to surveillance uh, that work on each of these issues. We have to stop seeing it as, uh, as either or uh, and recognize, uh, as Dr. Garrett said, the, there's so many overlaps here um, that everybody focusing narrowly on their slice of a pie when the pie as a whole isn't big enough anyway, uh, just isn't going to get us there and we'll get complacent. Uh, we'll move on to other priorities. Uh, and the next thing that hits us, uh, we'll be writing after actions and having commissions that unfortunately say the very same thing. Absolutely. To the three of you, thank you so much for what has been so far an absolutely incredibly insightful panel. And with this last just about minute, two minutes that we have, if I can just get you guys to popcorn around. So our theme for NAFAC this year is global resilience after the pandemic. And on that topic of resilience to close in this last minute, is there any good that we can look for? Any positives that we can see in the global community as the world begins to emerge from the pandemic? Yeah, I love this question because I've been studying many of the historical pandemics, you know, smallpox, plague, et cetera, and pandemics or serious infectious disease threats always create durable innovations. And I won't take time to go through all of them, but you can't find an infectious disease outbreak of consequence that hasn't resulted in some kind of lasting you know, whether it's vaccines or randomized clinical trials or serum therapy or, you know, in HIV, women controlled contraception and um, HIV uh, protection. So yes, there is extraordinary innovation and we need to treasure that because it is part of the solution to working our way through it. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, I hope it doesn't take crisis of this magnitude to foster that kind of innovation going forward. I think we're already sensing that all across America and possibly all the rest of the world, two, two words mean more to people than they did before, uh, family and community. And I, you know, where where the two work together well, where the protection of your family is the same to you as the protection of your community and your family is integral, is a part of a community. We see uh, people reaching out neighbor to neighbor, household to household, helping with getting people vaccinated, getting people food, caring for one another, making sure that that neighbor you haven't seen for a couple of days is okay. Um, where we see the nature of the family being uh, like some little uh, defense ball worried about this nasty community around it and in a conflicting and hostile relationship with the community at large. There we have seen problems over and over and over again across America and frankly all over the world. And, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that 2020 proved to be the year in America where we not only found ourselves dealing with COVID, but we found ourselves grappling with the whole um, 
way that racism has been a constant theme of being an American and how America confronts racism. And that's really about are communities together or are they separated? Are, do we come out of an epidemic recognizing it's not all for one and one for all, it's all for all. Yeah, it, it, the good news I see, you know, Mr. Rogers once said that his mother told him that in, when anything bad happens, always look for the helpers because there are always people helping, uh, neighbors helping neighbors. Uh, and I think the other thing that we have learned uh, is the value of frontline healthcare workers, the value of grocery store uh, employees, uh, and frankly, professions and jobs um, that uh, deserve uh, more dignity uh, and more respect uh, from the American people than they have had in the past. Uh, I think uh, and I hope uh, that America looks uh, with more respect uh, at all of those helpers going forward. Um, I see signs that that is the case. Uh, I see signs, you know, neighbors do help one another. Uh, and I'm optimistic that this has taught us some lessons we won't forget. Absolutely. Thank you all so much on behalf of both the United States Naval Academy and the Foreign Affairs Conference for your time today. We greatly appreciate all of the contributions that you've given us and I look forward to sharing this with the delegates at the conference coming up. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.